As gold in the furnace, the Lord put his chosen to the test. As sacrificial offerings, he took them to himself, and in due time they will be honored, and grace and peace will be with the elect of God. Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, who have made the blood of martyrs the seed of Christians, mercifully grant that the field which is your church, watered by the blood shed by Saints Charles Luanga and his companions, may be fertile and always yield to you an abundant harvest. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from the beginning of the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, for the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did as I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. For this reason I remind you to stir and to flame the gift of God that you have through the imposition of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather of power and love and self-control. So do not be ashamed of your testimony to our Lord, nor of me, a prisoner for his sake, but bear your share of hardship for the gospel with the strength that comes from God. He saved us and called us to a holy life, not according to our works, but according to his own design, and the grace bestowed on us in Christ Jesus before time began, but now made manifest through the appearance of our Savior Christ Jesus, who destroyed death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel, for which I was appointed preacher and apostle and teacher. On this account I am suffering these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know him in whom I have believed, and am confident that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To you, O Lord, I lift up my eyes. To you, O Lord, I lift up my eyes. To you, I lift up my eyes, who are enthroned in heaven. Behold, as the eyes of servants are on the hands of their masters. To you, O Lord, I lift up my eyes. As the eyes of a maid are on the hands of her mistress, so our eyes are on the Lord our God, till he have pity on us. To you, O Lord, I lift up my eyes. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Whoever believes in me will never die. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Some Sadducees, who say that there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and put this question to him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, If someone's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman and died, leaving no descendants. So the second brother married her and died leaving no descendants, and the third likewise. And the seven left no descendants. Last of all, the woman also died. 
At the resurrection, when they arise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had been married to her. Jesus said to them, Are you not misled because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like the angels in heaven. As for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God told him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly misled. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Sadducees are greatly misled because they miss something that had to be revealed, but something that then colors and directs the whole sweep of our lives, namely that we are not meant, we are not meant simply to plan for the next 40 years or 60 years or 80 years, however long you or I might have on this earth. We really don't know, do we? But we're not meant, and meant to be content simply to plan for what leads to human flourishing simply in this life. But Christ has come back from the dead, he has spanned the gap between the dead and the living and brought them out of their tombs into eternal life and revealed this to us so that we might be prepared, so that we in this life might achieve to the full measure of maturity and charity that we are meant to live. The Sadducees are gravely misled because they did not see this indication. They accepted only the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, which to this day in the Jewish community rank as, as scripture par excellence. Everything else is sort of secondary to the Torah, which they believe was revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai, every jot and tittle. We might be a bit more complex about it, but we also believe, of course, that it's revealed by God. But we do not believe that it is the center of revelation. For Christ takes flesh. Christ who spoke to Moses on the mountain takes flesh and reveals the full sweep and splendor of the Torah in a way that it could not itself manifest. So, we have this odd example today, right? And maybe your eyes glazed over when you heard about a man leaving a widow and his, se his second brother and third brother, and then all seven brothers eventually marrying this woman, poor woman. Though if they were, if they were nice guys, maybe it was not as bad. But a, a weird situation nevertheless and raised as a possibility by the Sadducees to try to show the absurdity of the resurrection. The practice in question that they're talking about is what's called Leverite marriage, which was an odd set of rules in the Torah, in the Torah, which the Sadducees would accept, and Christ, of course, would accept. And the aim was to try to keep a, a man's bloodline going. Again, the emphasis often in the time of the Old Testament was keeping your family going, keeping your heritage going, keeping your name going. And so the emphasis was that in the event that a man's uh, a wife, a man was to perish, his brother would marry that woman. Again, they tolerated polygamy back then, so one could do that. And the emphasis was on trying to raise up heirs in the deceased man's name. So the brother marries the woman, since she has no heirs, and attempts to provide some. Now, you might say, this is a bit strange. This isn't something exactly I would have signed up for on my wedding day as a possibility if things were not to work out. But you have to understand that often for the women, this was, this was the best option in a bad situation. They were guaranteed in a patriarchal society where men made the decisions and gathered the wealth and established households. They were guaranteed a household this way. They were guaranteed children this way, such as they might be able to achieve. And that deceased relative was guaranteed a descendant. And so the heritage of the family, the heritage of the overall clan, and its inheritance was guaranteed and assured. So an odd set of requirements, and not exactly something we see a priority in pursuing as such today, but for them it had considerable meaning. And that's why God presumably permitted that law to be promulgated. But for our purposes here, the Sadducees take that law and they try to use it to show the absurdity of resurrection. Because at the resurrection, this woman will have had seven husbands over the course of her life. And which of those seven would be her actual husband at the resurrection? 
they again see that the resurrection is absurd. There's a time you have on this earth, you give up your breath, you give up the ghost, and off you go. It would be absurd to maintain the resurrection of the body and some continuance of earthly life when the stories come to an end. Again, the idea was that the resurrection would come at the end of history. But he is not afraid to tell them that they are deceived because they do not know the scriptures or the power of God. And he points to the very center of the very set of books that they would accept as authoritative, namely Exodus chapter 3, verse, I believe, 16, I could be wrong on that, so where he says, I am, not I was, but I am the God of Abraham. I am, not I was, but I am the God of Isaac. I am, not I was at one point, but I am now the God of Jacob. For in him all are alive. God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And he has revealed himself to man, and ultimately, Christ suggests here, that he might share life with him. And so what looks absurd on one set of ideas and premises looks pretty reasonable on another. That for a woman to have multiple husbands over the course of her life, having been widowed, is eminently reasonable if you think the resurrection is a new phase of the story where marriage doesn't quite continue in the same way that it did here and now. But it does look absurd if you believe that the resurrection is simply going back to normal that it's simply a continuation of our earthly life here, that you'll mow the lawn on Saturdays, and you'll watch children's cartoons in the morning if, if you're eight, though I don't know how many people at the resurrection would be eight. But no, <laughs> this is not how it works. And Christ is in fact is trying to say this, that we will be like the angels, praising God, seeing him face to face, and rejoicing with our brothers and sisters, and that this will fill our hearts. This will fill our hearts. It's hard for us to imagine, as it's an experience we have not had, maybe in, in, in brief flickers of taste and in deep prayer, maybe you've had some intimation of what that would be like. If you're watching a daily Mass, you probably have. But even that doesn't compare to the full sweep and splendor of it. And so the Christian life is not simply about learning how to play well with others in this life. It's about turning our heads upward and being prepared for the full sweep and splendor of the life that Christ has come to reveal. Not one bound by the presuppositions that the Pharisees and our secular counterparts bring, that we have but this life and that's it, but knowing that we were not meant for the tomb, that the tomb is not a dead end, but rather a bridge, a portal, a door, a certain door towards life everlasting, through the victory that Christ, raised from the dead, has won for us. Today we celebrate the feast of St. Charles Luanga and his companions, who were pages in the court of an African king in what is modern-day Uganda. And his, he had converted several of the men working under this wicked king who had unruly desires for his pages and expected things from them that it was not right for them to give. One of the dangers of martyrdom that we can get swept up in is that we get lost in the sacrifice that the men made. And these men did sacrifice. They were burned alive. They suffered immensely. But that cannot be the full story. Because as great as, as endurance and fortitude and martyrdom are, they get their meaning, their efficacy, and their ultimate power from the justice of the cause. And this is where the ancient adage comes, that the justice of the cause makes the martyr. You can't be martyred for maintaining that strawberry ice cream is better than vanilla ice cream. Even if it's true, my grandfather would insist it's true. But that's not enough of a cause for martyrdom. Martyrdom has to be leveraged with the expansion and promulgation of true justice. And so for many in our world today, Charles Luanga and his companions would look not particularly heroic. Freudian psychologists in the 60s would say that they had hang-ups about their desires in resisting this king. Some in our time might call them bigoted for refusing to acquiesce to this. Or some who were more sympathetic might reduce the whole thing down to an example of sticking up, um, making a stand against workplace harassment. And again, that is a legitimate problem. But the stand that Charles Luanga and his companions were making was far more sweeping than that. It's not composed to these simple quotidian and ordinary limits that we would put on it in our cowardice and pragmatism. They offer their whole selves knowing that compromising in this situation would be something that would, would 
touch upon and, and hinder the overall story, the sweep of eternal life that they had assurances that they would inherit. To compromise in such a way can look quaint in our time, but their journey for, for purity, for chastity in the face of oppression and opposition, which again looks quaint to many today, is a battle worth fighting for. And their holiness and their resolve shows the justice of the cause. It shows that our presuppositions in our time that make their cause look quaint are actually quaint in comparison. That although these men died young, we can look at them and see how they truly lived. Although these men suffered for what they believed, they lived their lives confident that their belief meant something. And for those who would criticize them, who offer no alternative other than the pursuit of pleasure or simply living on one's own terms regardless of any mores or, or, or guiding points on how to live life and so to just grow blasé as you live entirely on your terms, we can say, you err greatly because you do not know the scriptures, you do not know the power of God, you do not even know what it means to be happy. Christ came and set the standard of virginity, of purity, of the moral life, not simply to give us a list of things to do to abide by him, but to give us the full sweep and drama of what fulfilled life even means. And in doing so, he provides us not only with his own example, but with the example of all those who stream after him and imitating him, whom we are invited to see as the standard, whom we are invited to see as those who correct whatever presuppositions we might bring. So let us look to these martyrs and their heroic witness, whom they who Paul VI called true heirs to the martyrs of the ancient church of Africa, true martyrs to the true heirs and successors to the ancient Christian martyrs of old. And so for that reason, I'll pray the Roman canon today, given St. Paul VI's comparison of them to the very martyrs in Africa who are named in the Roman canon, Felicity and Perpetua, these wonderful martyr saints who set the standard in a way far more demanding than we might choose, but also far more fulfilling than our limited standards might allow. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. We offer you sacrifice, O Lord, humbly praying that as you granted the blessed martyrs grace to die rather than sin, so you may bring us to minister at your altar in dedication to you alone, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit, lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, it is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. 
for the blood of your blessed martyrs, Charles Luanga and companions, poured out like Christ's to glorify your name, show, shows forth your marvelous works, by which in our weakness you perfect your power, and on the feeble bestow strength to bear you witness through Christ our Lord. And so with the powers of heaven we worship you constantly on earth, and before your majesty without end we acclaim, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Leonard, our Bishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants, and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls and hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Persimonus, John and Paul, Cosmos, and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his Almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the Just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, and the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith, and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace, through Christ our Lord. Amen. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon, through Christ our Lord. 
through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever. Savior's command and formed by divine teaching we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. And graciously grant our peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and with your spirit. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his holy ones. Alleluia. Let us pray. We have received this divine sacrament, O Lord, as we celebrate the victory of your holy martyrs. May what helped them to endure torment, we pray, make us in the face of trials steadfast in faith and in charity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke and we humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan, and all the spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen.